Hernandez, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're having trouble hearing you. I don't know if you need to get closer to the mic or is okay, some other you. issue. How's this? Thank you. Okay. Um, now, the fact that said, it is a fact that all Puerto Ricans, both civilian and military, who reside in Puerto Rico are U.S. citizens. However, they do not have all of the same constitutional rights that all citizens, including those Puerto Ricans living here in the U.S., have in the mainland, in the mainland states have. In other words, uh, if you are Puerto Rican, you were born there and you came here, now you have all the same rights that a regular U.S. citizen has. But if you were to establish residency in Puerto Rico, you would not have all the, all the same legal constitutional rights that stateside uh, people have, okay? Now, some of these absent rights include uh, a trial by jury, particularly in, in the federal court. Uh, the right, and especially the right to vote in federal elections for the president or voting for the um, rep members of Congress in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, okay? So you can't vote. Uh, additionally, if you reside in Puerto Rico, you have limited benefits when it comes to such things as Social Security, excuse me, <clears throat> Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and other services that you are entitled to in, in the full amount uh, in the U.S. Okay. That's because early in the 20th century, the Supreme Court ruled in a series of decisions that are collectively known as the insular cases, that Puerto Rico and certain other U.S. island territories, as in the Virgin Islands, for example, Guam and so forth, uh, <clears throat> are not on the path to sit to become states. Okay, they were set up as unincorporated territories, meaning that they could never become a state. Okay. So, since they could never become a state the court reasoned that they could not have all of the rights that a person living in the state has, okay? It's kind of strange. It is being challenged uh, later this year in the, in the federal court, but this is the way it stands at this moment. Uh, Miguel? Yes. 
Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, there's someone that's saying that your voice is a little bit too low. Too low? Uh, I, have it yeah. as, I have it as high as I can. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. I have, the, I have the mic almost up to my uh, mouth almost. <clears throat> okay. okay. I don't know if it's a problem of my mic or, or what, but, you know, I hear you all very very clearly. All right, let's go on. Um, now, getting back to these cases, the insular cases, uh, some, some of the rulings were kind of strange, but they deemed that Puerto Ricans, for example, were not entitled to jury trials because they, quote unquote, lived in, quote, ancient communities, uh, close quote, with customs and political concepts that were alien to institutions of Anglo-Saxon origin. In other words, you could say that it was based on race, okay? That's basically the race. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, finally, one case uh, said that Puerto Ricans were, quote, foreign in a domestic sense, foreign in a domestic sense. That is a key uh, issue here, why I say that the Puerto Rican soldiers are foreign legionnaires. The court said, in effect, that we were not citizens, although we had some form of citizenship, we were foreigners in a, in, a, in a domestic sense. It doesn't quite make sense to me, but this is, in fact, how they characterize it. Foreign, Puerto Ricans were foreign in a domestic sense. Okay. Now, uh, so in my estimation, anyway, um, the Congress can also, by the way, uh, at one time in 1917-18, uh, declared Puerto Ricans to be citizens, but again, they were not to be full citizens, and they did not have a choice at that time as to whether to be citizens or not. In other words, all persons born in Puerto Rico at that, that were born in Puerto Rico at that time automatically became citizens. They did not have to go through a naturalization process the same way that um, uh, others who come into the United States go through a natural process, or because they, they happen to be born here, they are natural citizens. So uh, Congress gave or, 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 or uh, citizenship to, to Puerto Rico. So there's some feeling supporters that whatever Congress gives, Congress can also take away, okay? So it's a different kind of, of uh, citizenship and uh, a second class kind of citizenship, some would even say, that differs substantially from the citizenship that people living in the U.S. has. Because nobody else in, that lives in the U.S. is, for example, denied um, the right to vote. I mean, you have to be a age, of course, meet certain qualifications. But everybody in the U.S. who is of age and so forth uh, can vote if they wish for president and for the members of Congress. So this is only exists in the U.S. It does not exist in the U.S. Now, that is why I refer to these U.S. citizen sol soldiers who live in Puerto Rico as members of the American Far uh, Foreign Legion. I'm going to just get into that a little further down the um, in this presentation. Anyway, it is an indisputable fact that in all of its history, at least in its history under the domination of Spain and the United States, Puerto Rico has never had a military of its own. Its own, but it does have a long military history. And on some other occasion, we're going to um, get into uh, uh, that history of, of Hispanic history in the United States, but not tonight. Uh, anyway, as a result of that, uh, this brief half hour presentation just covers the first 122 years that Puerto Rico has been under the domination of the United States. Okay, let's get on to the foreign legions or the various foreign legions so that you can get an idea of uh, what they look like and know the terms. Okay, um, the first one that comes to mind, or at least to my mind, is the French Foreign Legion. 
And um, there were dozens and dozens of films and Hollywood made films and French made films and other nations did it uh, about the Foreign Legion. It was a romantic um, uh, notion uh, because foreigners, uh, regardless of citizenship of any country in the world, could join the Foreign Legion. And most of them did it for the adventure. Others did it because they ran into trouble in their home, home nations and needed to start fresh. And the Legion asked no questions. You could just show up at the recruiting booth, say, I want to join the Legion. And um, you were in with, without you know, much investigation or so as to whatever you might have done in the past. Um, the French Foreign Legion uh, was established in, I believe, 1833. And it continues to this day. Uh, it is the shock troops that France sends into battle uh, to clean up some messes that uh, in Africa or, or other countries that at one point uh, had some sort of connection to France, was part of colonial France. They've also been in uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and other places as, as part of the, the allied forces in those countries. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a uh, picture of what they look now in their snappy uh, uniforms with uh, modern arms. Spain also has a foreign legion. It's called La Legión Española, the Spanish Legion. And they recruit their soldiers basically from uh, Latin America. And there are some uh, native born uh, Spaniards included in it. Uh, and they've been around since about 1920. And essentially they are, they are uh, like a copy of, uh, of very similar to the French Legion. They're used basically as Elite, elite troops, shock troops, uh, and most recently they have been in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and other trouble spots around the world as part of the UN peacekeeping missions. Uh, another uh, uh, interesting group is the Gurkhas, the Gurkha battalions. The Gurkhas are recruited exclusively from the mountain nation of Nepal, which is uh, to the north of um, between China and, uh, and India. And they are among the uh, fiercest troops uh, in the world. In fact, uh, it is said that in Great Britain that uh, if you are a soldier and you say that you are not afraid to go into battle, you either have to be a liar or a Gurkha. So that's the Gurkhas, uh, quite a group. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we've had experiences here with um, using US troops more or less as, as foreign legionnaires or fighting under the auspices of other nations. Probably the first one to do so was the 369th US Infantry, the Harlem Hellfighters, uh, the very famous regiment. Um, they, when they were sent over to uh, Europe, they're mostly from New York and, and other places, but when they were sent over to Europe to the war, none of the American generals wanted them in the war. They, they wanted to use these soldiers basically as, as laborers and as auxiliaries of various kinds. But the French were anxious to have them because the French did have experience with Africans. They were a part in, in Africa. They had the possession of certain countries there over the time. And when they got to the French command, they were welcomed with open arms and they were given uh, French army uniforms. And here you can see that they have the World War I French helmets, kind of rounded helmets. Um, and they perform magnificently well um, uh, during that time. Now, interestingly enough, as a side light, um, the 369th, there were several dozen, about three or four dozen um, Puerto Ricans um, in the 369th Infantry Regiment. Uh, and among the most well-known of those was Rafael and Jesus Hernandez. Rafael uh, is known as probably the premier composer of, of popular music in Puerto Rico. He has since died, but he was classically trained. And in fact, he, he did, uh, he, he has written an opera and I, I saw it perform one time in, in uh, New York City. Uh, El Pirata Cofresi, the story of the uh, a pirate, a famous pirate of, of Puerto Rico. Uh, anyway, in addition to being musicians, um, these Puerto Ricans, they, they came, they had a long history of being uh, 
being in municipal bands, and they were trained as classical musicians, many of them anyway. Uh, and James Reese Europe was the um, uh, man in charge, the uh, officer in charge of the band, the Harlem Hellfighters Band. And he went to Puerto Rico to specifically uh, recruit these uh, Puerto Rican musicians. So there were about 18 or so in the band. And of course, there were other people, um, other Puerto Ricans who lived in New York and were drafted or, or you know, lived in Harlem or, and, and volunteered uh, themselves to, to participate. So this is Rafael Hernandez here. And this is his brother, Jesus. In addition to that, uh, these musicians also drove ambulances on the battlefield. So they were in the thick of the fighting. Uh, another group of Americans that fought in World War II under the auspices of a foreign country was the Lafayette Escadrille. Uh, they were uh, pilots, okay? And they were trained as pilots here in the US and both in, uh, overseas. And um, they became a special unit under French command, flying French planes, French equipment, French, uh, French everything. Uh, and of course, they had, they had to learn the language. Uh, I don't have his picture up here, but um, one of these flyers uh, was um, an Osnane resident, and he was the first uh, American killed, uh, shot down over Germany. But they compiled quite an interesting uh, 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 record, um, knocking down the Red Baron troop flyers and so forth in Germany. Another uh, group of Americans um, that fought under uh, the control of another country was the so-called Liberian Frontier Force, which was comprised of, of Liberians in Africa, but also the officers were all American. And uh, this is uh, Colonel, he technically became a Colonel, but Colonel uh, Young, oops, back. Yes, this is uh, uh, Major Young, uh, he's a West Point graduate and he was detailed to go over to Liberia and to train these uh, forces. And they were around from about 1908 to 1944, but they went out of existence in 1944, okay. Brazil also uh, operated under the command of the United States Army in World War II, and the uh, Brazilian Expeditionary Force, as it was called, was comprised of uh, both pilots that you see here uh, infantry troops, and uh, I don't have a picture over here of the Navy. They had a small Navy that they were, were involved in combat in the Atlantic Ocean, chasing German subs. They performed magnificently well in, in uh, battles in, um, in Italy. Uh, Monte Castello was one of the uh, premier battles of that war, and they lost, uh, over the war, they lost well over 500 uh, 500 Brazilians. So, so they were a, uh, a very brave unit uh, and were in the thick of the fighting in World War II, particularly in Italy. Another group of Americans that fought under American under a, a control of a foreign nation was the Flying Tigers. The Flying Tigers um, were, in fact, uh, under the control of General Chiang Kai-shek. The, the nationalist leader of uh, China at that time, who ultimately was exposed by the uh, Chinese communists. But they flew um, hundreds and hundreds of missions and were, were um, basically like Hollywood stars in, in both China and uh, elsewhere in the world at the time. They were, they were like uh, rock stars, uh, these guys. Um, here is, uh, oops. Okay, here is Donald S. Lopez. Lopez was a, uh, is Puerto Rican. Uh, he's, he's born in Brooklyn, I believe in the uh, Marcy Houses uh, uh, projects in Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, he originally um, joined the, um, the Canadian uh, Air Force and then went to the IRAF and then wound up ultimately with the uh, with the Flying Tigers. Um, uh, he ultimately, uh, after the war, got uh, master's degrees in engineering and so forth. And he was a professor of aeronautics uh, at, at uh, the Air Force Academy. And then he became the, um, the 
assistant director or deputy director of the Air and Space Museum in uh, Washington, D.C. I had an opportunity uh, before he died uh, to talk to him on the phone. Uh, another uh, group that served under American forces and it was separate units was the Filipinos. Uh, oh, well over, as you know, the Japanese took over the Philippines uh, and uh, they were resisted by the uh, Filipinos and um, they served basically under General MacArthur who at one time was the uh, US uh, uh, in charge of all the uh, Philippine forces. Uh, so that's them. Then we have the Japanese American units. Uh, this is the members of the 442nd uh, Regimental Combat Team. This, was, this unit was uh, probably the most decorated unit of World War II. Uh, the interesting fact about them is not only that they were Japanese, but that many of their uh, relatives were interred in, uh, in uh, uh, camps uh, on the West Coast because uh, the government at that time feared that the Japanese would residents, uh, many of them were citizens, many of them were born here, but that somehow they were subversive and would um, um, commit acts of terrorism against the Americans. That, of course, never happened. But um, another group that fought under American auspices, foreigners, that were the Mexicans uh, of the, um, I believe it's, they, were, they call themselves the Aztec Eagles. And they flew American planes, uh, fighter, fighter planes, mostly in the Pacific. Uh, and they compiled quite a record themselves there uh, by providing air support to American troops, strafing Japanese uh, bases uh, and troops along the way. So they had uh, several hundred of these pilots there. Even the Norwegians got into the act. Norwegian Americans were recruited into a separate uh, battalion, the 99th uh, uh, Battalion separate. It was comprised of Norwegians and uh, North Americans. And they fought in some of the most uh, bitter battles of World War II. They were recruited basically because the, uh, the US felt that many of them were German speaking and could be useful uh, in battles with the Germans. And they um, fought in the Battle of the Bulge um, and, and, and other, uh, other battles. They took on a lot of casualties and they inflicted a lot of casualties. So they were a very effective group. A lot of them were, were uh, recruited in uh, Minnesota. The Norwegian Americans were recruited in, as you know, Minnesota is known to be uh, heavily populated by uh, Norwegian immigrants. Finally, we have the Pontifical Swiss Guards. They probably have the most colorful and unique uniforms of anything. And they swear allegiance to the Pope and they protect the, the Vatican. Uh, in the past, they were fighters, uh, soldiers on the battlefield on behalf of the Pope. But um, now they are basically like um, a, uh, uh, an honor guard and uh, high level security uh, like the um, like the American um, Secret Service protects the president. This is the function of the uh, Swiss Guard. So foreign legions are as old as antiquity. They, the US has always opposed them, but nevertheless, they did employ them in various wars uh, uh, to, and allow them to serve under, their, under US colors, as you have seen, and we have allowed uh, our troops to serve under foreign colors, even though, you know, there's always a, a claim we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, if you recall, during the uh, Revolutionary War, we're going back a ways, but uh, we were quite angry that the King of Britain uh, uh, hired German mercenaries, as they were then called, to fight against it. In fact, this was one of the complaints that the Americans included in the, um, not the Declaration of Independence, but uh, yes, in the Declaration of Independence. So now getting to the heart of the matter, the uh, Puerto Ricans. Uh, Puerto Rico was uh, ruled by Spain, um, uh, basically on, it was discovered, or as they say, or Columbus came upon it on his second voyage in 1493. Uh, but it took a number of years for, for the Spanish to really take 
over in Puerto Rico because they did encounter a lot of resistance uh, from the Taino Indians, but ultimately they were able to overcome the, uh, the Tainos. Uh, but along comes, uh, and they, they decided, the Spanish, that instead of sending Spanish troops to Puerto Rico, it would be better if they recruited uh, Puerto Ricans who were living, who were born in Puerto Rico at that time, and were living in Puerto Rico, and they created uh, several militia units, uh, who did surprisingly, I wouldn't say surprisingly, they did very well uh, in rejecting various invasions of Puerto Rico by the English, by the Dutch, uh, by the French, and other European powers who want to take over Puerto Rico. But uh, the Americans did succeed in taking over Puerto Rico, and this really began on May 12, 1898, when a Spanish fleet, I mean, excuse me, when an American fleet of about 10 ships suddenly appeared off the coast of San Juan and began to uh, bombard it without any warning. And here you see uh, one of the few pictures of that that was taken from one of the ships. This is the Moro Castle. And you can see that the smoke from the bombing, bombing American ships are, are hitting it. But it began in 19, 1898. And it got, did not really complete itself until August of 1898. So it didn't last that long. And the reason was that um, Spain had really no much, not too much interest in keeping Puerto Rico. They had very few troops there to begin with. They had about 8,000 troops and they were, um, and they had uh, 8,000 um, Puerto Rican militia. So I had 16,000 troops, but they were overwhelmed um, by the, uh, by the American troops who had uh, double that number, about 30, 30,000 troops or so. But anyway, uh, this is where the war began. And um, a treaty was, was uh, reached between, uh, uh, in, in the city of Paris in 1898, between Spain uh, and the United States in which um, uh, several possessions, of Spanish possessions were turned over being to, to uh, the US being Cuba, the Philippines and a bunch of other islands out in the Pacific. And basically this treaty said that the civil rights and political status of the native inhabitants and territories are hereby ceded to the United States shall be determined by Congress. Okay. Basically what this says is that Congress alone is in charge of Puerto Rico. Okay. I know we have a local government in Puerto Rico, but comparatively speaking, any decisions of any major import that impact uh, the federal control of Puerto Rico, is, it's all decided by Congress. So the treaty said it that way, basically I put that in to say to all the territories, only Congress can determine what the rules are. And that includes the rules of whether they would become a state or not, or become independent or not, or whatever. Congress makes all of the important rules in Puerto Rico. So it's treated, uh, you know, as a, as they would def a defeated country, even though Puerto Rico itself was not defeated. The other interesting thing about this uh, event was that here, is the, here are the people signing the treaty in, in Paris, and not one Puerto Rican or Cuban, for that matter, or Filipino is present at this meeting. In other words, this treaty and everything in it was decided strictly by the US and Spain with no input whatsoever. Now, please keep in mind that in 1898, Puerto Rico was a province of Spain. It was part and parcel of Spain. It could vote in the Spanish parliament, okay? It had certain rights. It's a, it was the province just the same way that um, uh, the, the province of um, in any province that you might think of in Spain, the Canary Islands, for example, and others. So Puerto Rico was, was an, uh, a, like a quasi-independent um, nation at that time and a full province of the nation of Spain, the kingdom of Spain. Again, um, all of this was based on the territorial clause of the constitution. Not too many people are aware of this particular clause in the constitution. It's hidden among other things. Uh, it's not out there in sort of plain sight as, as you might think. And it says that the Congress has, shall have the power to dispose and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property 
belonging to the United States, and nothing in this Constitution shall be construed as to produce any claims of the United States or any of the state, blah, blah, blah. So um, this, again, emphasizes the fact that, that Congress rules Puerto Rico to this day. And let's I get back to this um, uh, case, which was <clears throat> Downs v. versus Bidwell, 1901 U.S. Supreme Court, said that Puerto Rico is not a state of the American Union, nor is it an independent nation. The court said it is a non-incorporated territory, appurtenant, and belonging to the United States, but not an in integral part of the United States. It is thus foreign in a domestic sense. I, I want to keep emphasizing that foreignness. But a lot of people say Puerto Rico is part of the US. I hear that phrase all the time. But in fact, it is not, at least according to the Supreme Court, uh, you know, which made this decision and, and the US Congress, that Puerto Rico is not a part of the United States. It belongs to the United States. It's quite a different kettle of fish, if you will. Uh, again, under, these, under this Jones Shepard Act, Puerto Ricans were given, of 1917, 18, Puerto Ricans were given statutory and limited uh, US citizenship. As I said before, they cannot vote for president and Congress can revoke their citizenship. I don't think they would do it, but it doesn't look that way. Now, many of you know that in Puerto Rico, there have been various votes to decide the, the ultimate political fate of the island. Should it be independent? Should it be a state? Or should it continue uh, being a dependency of, of the United States? Well, the fact is that not too many people vote in these uh, um, referendums because this is a, the Congress is not bound by the results of that, okay? In other words, every Puerto Rican in the world can vote uh, to become independent or whatever status you want to pick. And it will not matter because ultimately Congress is the one, it's not binding on the Congress. Only, it's only binding, only Congress can decide and Congress has basically ignored, uh, I think the last time they had a, a people, about 60% of the voters voted for statehood, but Congress never acted on that decision of the voters in Puerto Rico, okay? And again, I wanna say that at least technically, Congress can, can revoke citizenship. I don't think it'll happen, but anyway, this is a, a Governor Yeager who, under which all of this passed, and I believe this is here. Uh, and all of his cabinet, by the way, not all of his cabinet, most of his cabinet with one or two exceptions were, were people from the United States, former congressmen and you know, people who supported uh, presidents in the, in the previous election. Okay, so the Congress decided back in 1899 that they wanted to uh, have Puerto Ricans defend their own islands. So uh, because it was, it was cheaper than sending uh, U.S. troops there. You know, after the Spanish-American War, the the uh, U.S. Army um, cut back on its troops the way it does after almost every war, uh, and they didn't have enough troops. They wanted to use them for other things, and they felt that the Puerto Ricans could uh, best defend their own island, and so they created the what was then called the Puerto Rico Infantry Battalion. Uh, these men that you see here are from the company of Lattice, which happens to be my hometown in, in Puerto Rico, okay? Uh, and uh, they wore cast off U.S. Army uniforms. Here they're, they're in the tropics, they're wearing blue wool shirts, uh, canvas pants, and I imagine, you know, under that heat, it wasn't, wasn't an easy thing to do. So they created this unit uh, and which was, um, paid for by the U.S., they were, you know, uh, uniformed by the U.S., courted by the U.S., armed by the U.S., and so forth. So, but these, at that time, this was before Puerto Ricans were declared to be citizens, by the way. This was 19, 1899, citizenship came in 1917. So these folks here, as you see lined up here, were, were then citizens of Puerto Rico. Citizens of Puerto Rico may sound funny, but Puerto Ricans do have their own separate distinct and unique form of citizenship, which is still in effect. 
Okay, Puerto Ricans such as myself, we have dual citizenship. We are Puerto Rican citizens, okay? And I can, you can get a certificate that says you're a, you're a Puerto Rican citizen and you are a citizen also of the US, but again, with lesser uh, civil rights. This is the Puerto Rico Regiment here later on, in, Volunteer Infantry as it was called. Um, you can see they had different, they had now switched to a, a more comfortable tropical uniform, white clothing and so forth. This is the flag of uh, Company F. These are the officers uh, back in 1906. And of all of them, only one, uh, one man here is, uh, is Puerto Rican. Everyone else, every one of the other officers were North Americans, as they say, or continentals, as they say in Puerto Rico, continental. Okay, now um, this is uh, just to show you uh, uh, what somebody looked at in a close-up with a dress uniform, Agapito Lopez. I believe he was from uh, Aguadilla, 1918, just as about the, the war is about to begin, the First World War is about to begin. Uh, some people say that Puerto Ricans were made uh, citizens so that they could be drafted into the army. I'm not so sure about that. I think it's, it's possible, but not likely. Okay. Now here's an interesting person that uh, you should all know. Uh, this is Luis Raul Esteves. He's also from Aguadilla, Puerto Rico, as I said at that time. Uh, and uh, he was appointed to West Point. Uh, he came from a, a fairly you know, middle-class family. And um, he decided that he wanted, for whatever reasons, he, he wanted to be an officer in the United States Army. And he was able to get a, um, the resident commissioner of Puerto Rico. The resident commissioner is a person who, who sits in Congress and represents Puerto Rico in Congress for only, but cannot vote in Congress, okay? He can, you know, if there are any matters that come up that concern Puerto Rico, the resident commissioner is consulted. Anyway, he, he had the power to appoint people uh, to West Point, And one of them was Raul Esteves. Now, Esteves was also um, remarkable because um, during all the time that he was here uh, at West Point, the four years, he never once was able to go home for, to Puerto Rico for the holidays. So he stayed here and he became friends with a lot of the cadets here, and most notably uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who also graduated class of 1915. And um, uh, Dwight Eisenhower was failing in Spanish. So um, Luis Raul Esteves saved his bacon, tutored him in Spanish and enabled him uh, to get, a, I think a C or a D, I'm not sure. And so uh, that is how Eisenhower ultimately uh, passed, passed his exams and was given his second lieutenant's uh, uh, bars as, as a member of the class of 1915. The class of 1915 was one of the most famous classes of West Point and practically all of the major, all of the generals who fought in World War II come, come out of that, came out of that class. I, obviously Eisenhower being the prime example. Here he is again uh, as a major general. He made the general, he was the first to get the general star. And um, obviously he was a very bright person. Uh, but um, when World War II came around, he wanted in the worst way to be sent to Europe to fight. But, and he called his friend uh, Dwight Eisenhower and Dwight said, no, Raul, I need you to stay in Puerto Rico. I need you to train troops there for the war, for, for the war in uh, the Second World War. So much to his um, dismay, he spent the entire war uh, in Puerto Rico. He did have one overseas adventure that was prior to World War I, uh, when he was at the Mexican border uh, chasing Pancho Villa all over Hill and Dale down there. I don't think he was, he, I don't think, but he, they took him because basically of his Spanish speaking ability. And in fact, he was very well liked in Mexico and um, one community down there uh, elected him as, as their mayor. So that was his, um, that was his one overseas adventure. Um, anyway, he, he, he then went on to, to uh, Founded in 1920, the Puerto Rico National Guard, 
and ultimately became involved in, in um, the creation of the 65th Infantry. The 65th Infantry was created out of various National Guard units and reserve units, and um, they, they um, um, ultimately merged together into the 65th Infantry Regiment, the United States Infantry Regiment. Another famous uh, Puerto Rican military person of that era, believe it or not, was Lieutenant Pedro Albizo Campos. Some of you know, may know, uh, have heard of him. He was the leader of the nationalist movement in Puerto Rico who sought to um, uh, have Puerto Rico defend, uh, become independent of the United States. He was a Harvard graduate, uh, graduated first in his class uh, and a first in his law school and would have been the, um, the uh, valedictorian, but um, the professorship at, uh, at the Yale School, uh, school said, uh, no, uh, we, can't have, we can't have this person, particularly a black man, to be valedictorian, so he was turned out. He became very bitter about this, and he was also bitter about the fact that when the war broke out, he, he joined the 375th uh, Regiment, which was a, a, a U.S. Army Infantry Reserve Regiment. However, it was a segregated, it was a segregated unit because they had the 376, which was comprised of quote unquote white Puerto Ricans. So he was quite resentful of this. Uh, and this is his experiences at Yale and his experiences uh, in this unit, uh, in the segregated unit, embedded him toward the, was one of the things anyway, that embedded him toward the United States. And therefore he uh, decided that the best course for Puerto Rico was to become independent. Uh, he was involved in the writing of the uh, Declaration of Independence. Uh, he allied himself to the Irish revolutionaries uh, as well. And he, was, he had been in Ireland several times and in, in other foreign countries as, as well. Uh, he was ultimately in 1950, um, the uh, Puerto Rican Nationalist Party, which he led, rose up in revolt against the government of uh, Luis Munoz Marin, uh, who was the first Puerto Rican elected to, to uh, by the Puerto Ricans as governor, 1948. And um, his, some of his followers, as some of you may recall, shot up the Congress, and they also tried to assassinate uh, Harry Truman. They, they fired some shots uh, at his guards outside of uh, Blair House, where uh, Truman was at that time. That was in the, in the 1950s. Uh, anyway, getting back to uh, the First World War, in 1917, the, the, uh, the Puerto Rico Volunteer Infantry Regiment, the U.S. Army, was uh, dispatched to um, Panama. And there in Panama, the re reason they went to Panama was, number one, the U.S. Army did not want to give them a chance to fight, although they did want to go to Europe to fight as a regiment, but they were tasked to go to Panama and guard the Panama Canal, which was under threat uh, by German saboteurs. So uh, this was actually very tough duty, perhaps tough than, as tough as Europe in some sense, in that it was all jungle there at the time, Panama, uh, wild animals, wild uh, snakes, uh, diseases of all kinds. So they spent uh, two years. It was boring duty, okay, uh, waiting for uh, Germans to attack, which who, who never did. And they also um, served to uh, as guards for uh, a camp where uh, German prisoners of war were held. Along comes uh, World War II, and now the um, the 65th Infantry Regiment is seen here uh, bivouacking uh, near San Juan uh, and they're getting ready to, uh, to go to, the, uh, to Panama, which where they were going to be sent again. Okay, this is like 1941, I believe. Anyway, uh, in, in addition to the, um, to the uh, regular forces, uh, let me see, the enlisted forces in Puerto Rico, of the 65th Infantry, the 295th uh, uh, National Guard Unit, uh, and others, and they had the Coastal Artillery and some other units manned by Puerto Ricans. 
staffed by Puerto Ricans. Uh, the Puerto Ricans also sent in some of their uh, people who had graduated, both from the uh, United States Naval Academy uh, and from the uh, uh, other academies, okay, into the war. One was Admiral Horacio Rivera. They call him Rivets Rivera. Uh, quite uh, well liked in the Navy. Quite um, quite a hero himself, as you can see. Uh, Admiral Frederick Riscoll. Uh, it's a German name, but in the 19th century, many Germans um, did uh, immigrate to Puerto Rico and settled in, 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 in particularly around Ponce and, and other areas and they, they went on to establish businesses and so forth. So the Germans were quite a presence in Puerto Rico. Uh, then we have General Pedro del Valle, United States Marine Corps. He's also a graduate of the Naval Academy of class of 1915. And uh, one other person, I mean, there's several more, but one other person you should know is Brigadier General Miguel Gilormini. Gilormini um, was a pilot founded the uh, Air National Guard. Uh, he tried to join the US Air Corps, was rejected, Army Air Corps was rejected. So he went up to Canada. Uh, the Canadians took him. He was part of the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. He then transferred to the um, Royal Air, Air Force in, in Great Britain. And then ultimately when the US entered the war, uh, he became part of the United States Army Air Force. and. Uh, he was a, um, what do you call it, an ace pilot knocking down at least five German aircraft. Uh, there were many, many more, you know, we don't have time to go through them all. Uh, but it's not only the men who were involved in uh, as soldiers, it was the women. First, obviously, they had um, nurses, as you can see here. Uh, Tech 4 Carmen Contreras was in charge of, she was one of the many women that went to both the United States and to Europe to serve in clerical positions, uh, basically. Uh, and here's uh, Lieutenant uh, Junior Grade Maria Rodriguez of the United States Navy. So there were hundreds, if not thousands, of women, Puerto Rican women, who served in the, in the military during World War II. Uh, during the war, uh, as I said before, the, the 65th Infantry Regiment, at least initially, was not allowed to go into battle. Uh, they were derisively called by a lot of people in the Pentagon as the rum and Coca-Cola regiment, okay? Meaning that uh, all they were good for was sitting around the barracks and having rum and Coke. Uh, I'm sure they, they drank their fair share of rum and Cokes, but they were actually quite good. But because of uh, discriminatory policies, they were not, not allowed to, into, into battle. But ultimately, uh, after several years, they first went to Panama uh, and they would, sort of destined to go to fight in the Pacific, but uh, because they were trained in jungle warfare. But for some reason, um, uh, Douglas MacArthur did not want this, uh, the 65th. He had heard things about it and he wasn't pleased with it, so he, he refused to take them on. So they wound up going to uh, North Africa and there they began did more training and ultimately from North Africa, they made their way to, um, to Sicily, uh, where they engaged in some combat in Sicily. And then they leaped over into France and then into Germany. And ultimately, the unit wound up on the border of uh, France and uh, Italy in the, uh, in the Mediterranean Alps, where they got their first real taste of hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, not hand-to-hand, -hand, but, but combat with, uh, with the German troops there who put up a a fierce battle. They lost um, 350 uh, men uh, in the um, in the Alps there. And uh, when you uh, are wounded or you die, uh, you get you get a medal posthumously. And this is the Purple Heart award ceremony that was held for the kin of some of the soldiers that were killed there. And as you can see. Uh, it was quite an emotional uh, moment when they got this medal and, you know, just the fact that they wouldn't ever see their son, husband, uh, whatever, uh, again. One of the most outstanding fighters of the 65th Infantry Regiment was uh, 
Sergeant Agustin Ramos Calero. He was the most decorated Hispanic, not just Puerto Rican, but all the Hispanic troops of World War II. Uh, and he got practically every medal except the, uh, the, uh, the Medal of Honor. This is in 1945 now, the Puerto Ricans are coming home. And this is uh, their ship as it arrives in San Juan Harbor. And they're all happy, of course, and, and cheering. Uh, here's another picture of that, of that event. Uh, I think I showed you this before. I'm going to get to the main event, the 65th Infantry in, in Korea. But uh, this is a painting that hangs in the Pentagon in Washington, DC. And it depicts the, the 65th, the, uh, a battalion of the 65th Infantry Regiment, uh, who in 1951, just north of um, Seoul, uh, chased uh, a division of uh, Chinese troops off a mountain, uh, basically with, just with their bayonets. The call went out, fix bayonets. And um, when you hear fix bayonets, and you hear the click of hundreds, if not thousands of bayonets suddenly uh, being attached to your rifle. It's a scary sound. So they charged up the mountain and, and took, took over and, and the Japanese, I mean, excuse me, the, uh, the Chinese troops uh, just basically fled in, in, absolute, uh, in absolute terror. And, this is, and the regiment went on from Pusan, which is the south, immediate south end of Korea, all the way up to the Yalu River as part of the 3rd Infantry uh, Division. Uh, so um, during the Korean War, they basically earned their stripes, so to speak, uh, and they performed well in, in um, hundreds of battles, uh, capturing uh, uh, prisoners left and right, uh, killing um, the enemy, uh, doing everything. Here it is shown after a battle. Uh, this is a soldier. I don't know who he is. I'm sorry to say. Uh, it was cold as hell in Korea. Colder than hell, I should say, in Korea. Korea is a very cold country. And at first, the Puerto Ricans had no, did not have the proper clothing. They were basically tropical troops that had just come from Panama, you know, <clears throat> and, and from uh, Africa, North Africa. <clears throat> so they did not have the right, the, the right uh, uniforms. Nevertheless, they rose to the occasion uh, and, and um, were possibly the most, one of the most decorated units of the Korean War. Uh, everywhere they went, they carried their flag, the Puerto Rican flag, and you can see them here. This flag was shot full of holes, uh, had been in, in quite a number of scrapes, and, in, and uh, they needed a new one, so this is they're holding it up for the last time in, 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 this, in this picture. Now, um, other states uh, don't have flags, of course, but this was the only unit in Korea that came from a particular country or everybody, everybody, you know, obviously they did have, you know, people from the United States in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the 65th, mostly the, the officers, okay? Uh, they took a lot of, a lot of losses. Uh, this is from the newspaper, um, Stars and Stripes, which is, understand, has been shut down. Um, anyway, um, here they are at mass uh, praying for their, for their fallen comrades. As I said, they were the most uh, decorated um, units of the Korean War. Uh, they participated in nine major campaigns, uh, and they won thousands of Purple Hearts. Again, this is the Purple Heart. This is the medal you get for somebody who's killed. Uh, they lost um, about 750 uh, men during the war. That's quite a number considering the small size of Puerto Rico for, for any state, okay? Uh, they got 10 of these Distinguished Service Medals. This is the second highest award that's given uh, by the United States for uh, bravery on the field. This is the Medal of Honor, which is the highest award. The, only one soldier got it. Uh, this is the Silver Star. They got hundreds of Silver Stars. This is the third highest award. And here's the Bronze Star. Again, there were quite a number of Bronze Stars. That's for participation 
in a particular battle. Uh, here you see uh, Second Lieutenant uh, Vidal Rodriguez Amaro, uh, Company I. He's getting his his second silver medal. I believe altogether he got three of them uh, during the conduct of, of the war. Uh, recently, uh, Congress finally came around to recognizing the contributions of the 65th Infantry Regiment, and they were awarded the, the gold medal of honor. This is a separate medal, and uh, it's, it's quite a, I don't know if that's the size of it, but uh, I've seen it's pretty large, and then you hang it around your neck, and uh, has the, the regimental motto, uh, motto, honor and fidelity, it's in Latin. Uh, this is the crest of arms of the 65th Infantry Regiment, which is um, the regiment uh, traces its ancestry in a, in a way back to the Crusades. Okay, this is the, the cross of St. John, La Cruz de San Juan. Uh, and uh, here is the, again, showing them, I suppose this is the, the bayonet charge, the famous bayonet charge. Uh, I met this man, uh, Sergeant Modesto Cartagena. He is the most decorated soldier, uh, Puerto Rican soldier of the regiment of um, the, the uh, Korean War. He died recently. He should have gotten the Congressional Medal of Honor, but uh, for some reason the paperwork was lost, they say, or whatever happened, we don't know. But I mean, uh, if you read his citation, uh, I'm not gonna read it here, uh, it's, it's absolutely frightening what this man did <clears throat> in, that, in that war. Uh, probably the only middle that all of these soldiers are, uh, 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 badge that these soldiers are most proud of is the combat infantry badge, which you see right, right here. It always goes on the top. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Douglas MacArthur was so enamored or so, um, who had, he had rejected them, as I mentioned to you before, uh, you know, World War II. But this is what he wrote. The Puerto Ricans forming the ranks of the gallant 65th Infantry in the battlefields of Korea, and so forth and so on. You can read it just as well as I can. But um, uh, this was high praise, high praise indeed, from somebody who, who uh, initially thought little of them. Uh, along comes the, um, the, the uh, Vietnam War. And uh, uh, thousands of Puerto Ricans participated in this, both uh, from Puerto Rico and those born here in, uh, in, the, in the States. Uh, one of people that um, should be recognized uh, and, and rarely is, is uh, Felix Neco Quinones. Sergeant Quinones uh, spent uh, 600 days, 600 plus days <clears throat> as a prisoner of the Viet Cong, uh, excuse me, in one of the, these tiger cages at the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, <clears throat> and anyway, he has written a book on it. I'll show you the title later on. It's in Spanish. It's hard to get, but he is the only uh, Puerto Rican to ever have written a, 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 of his experiences as a prisoner of war. So it's not just John McCain and the, you know, the people that you normally hear of. This young man, happens to be my cousin. Uh, I knew him well. We grew up together in Brooklyn. So he's on the wall. Jose Rafael Tavares Torres of New York, but he's actually born in Puerto Rico. <clears throat> okay, come along comes the war in Iraq and we deployed the National Guard Regiment to Iraq, and here they are at some camp in Iraq. Um, this is the 295th uh, National Guard unit. It looks like Company C on the flag I can read. And they also had the 167th Field Artillery Regiment in Afghanistan. And here is one of the soldiers who uh, unfortunately was killed in Vietnam, Jason Nunez Fernandez. Um, we also had the first female, U.S. female um, soldier died, was also a Puerto Rican. I couldn't find a picture of her. Anyway, for those of you who want to know more about this entire situation, 
uh, here are a series of books that uh, you might want to might want to find. From the political end, I would recommend to you The Trials of the Oldest Colony in the World by Jose Trias Monge. He was a judge of the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico. He's retired since then, but he delves deeply into um, this whole issue of the status, political status of Puerto Rico and why it is, you know, he's, a, he's not a revolutionary, uh, obviously he's a judge, uh, but he writes about um, uh, that situation and why it needs to be changed. Um, the seminal book about Puerto Rico's uh, fighting in, 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 in the Korean War was written by uh, Colonel uh, Harris, as you see here, uh, William W. Harris. He wrote Puerto Rico's Fighting 65th Infantry from San Juan to Chihuahuan. And um, he was an interesting guy. He was a West Pointer. And uh, just before the break of the of World War II breakout, he is sent to be in charge of the 65th, and he was not at all happy. He he did not think that this was a good fighting regiment. He found out differently, and he became uh, a, a absolutely enamored of them, and became their champion during the Korean War, and said, "People have got to know what." what these people are made of. So Puerto Rico's Fighting 65th Infantry, I recommend it highly. This is a book that's hard to get. The, the New York Public Library has a copy. Uh, it's called, it's, uh, the author is Manuel Munoz Rivera. And the name of the title of the book is Hacia Donde Héroes, Whither the Heroes in English. And it's the only book that I know that's written, by, again, by a Puerto Rican soldier about his experiences in World War II. Uh, if you can get it and you read Spanish, it's, it's, a, it's quite an eye opener. And maybe someday, if I ever get the time and, and the brains, I'll, I'll translate it into English. Uh, Jose Muriati, he wrote a general history. Okay, another great book is Honor and Fidelity, which is the motto of the 65th century. It was written by uh, Colonel uh, Gilberto Villa Hermosa. Uh, Fiat Mosa discusses in detail uh, the black mark against that was leveled against the 65th Infantry in Korea. They had been, uh, the regiment had been um, uh, uh, charged with taking over a hill, which they charged uh, two times and were beaten back by greater forces, greater Chinese forces. Uh, they were promised air air cover, planes to help them, artillery cover, but this never came. So they were ordered up one more time and they refused to go. I think it was about a hundred men altogether. They refused to go. And so they were uh, court-martialed, charged with sedition, tra treason, and so forth. And uh, he goes to, into it, into that, uh, the Battle of Kelly, Kelly Hill, uh, as it was called, in great detail. And uh, if you want to know about that event, but ultimately they were exonerated. Every man was pardoned and they went off. Uh, and they, they be then returned to Puerto Rico, but this time as a National Guard unit. It's the first time in history that a U.S. Infantry Regiment gets uh, transferred to the National Guard. But they're still there in Puerto Rico. They're still making a good name for themselves. And they're out there every day uh, fighting for us. Okay, uh, I mentioned before the Viet Cong book, uh, 1,650 days captive of the Viet Cong, Modest, Modesto Nieco, Nieco. <laughs> okay, and as I mentioned before, the political book, um, Trials of the Oldest Colony, and then one more, which is at the top here, you can't see it too well, but it's called Foreign, oops, what happened? Oops. Foreign in a Domestic Sense, okay? Again, this explains all of the legal mumbo jumbo, but it's in language that everybody, everybody can understand. So they, they capture the essence of the status of Puerto Rico, and at least according to the authors and a lot of other people, why this needs to be changed. Why Congress has to let the Puerto Ricans truly decide what their fate shall be. Uh, that concludes the program. And um, 
I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if we have time, uh, Michael, do we have time? Um, yeah, we have some time for questions. Okay, I'll take a few questions if anybody has any. You can unmute yourselves, I believe. I don't have a question. My name's Roland in Missouri, but I found this very informative. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, thanks a lot, Roland. I appreciate it. Okay, everyone. Uh, without further ado, then, uh, I bid you buenas noches and uh, hope that we meet again. Okay, thank you so much, Miguel. You're so quite welcome. Thank you. I got a lot out of this. Thank you. All right. Bye. Okay. Good night, everyone.